Hello and welcome to Spotlight. As Israel's genocidal war on Gaza continues, with full support from the United States, uh, the two allies have not backed down from carrying out acts of terrorism in the West Asia region. Only in recent days, uh, the Israeli regime has assassinated two important figures of uh, the region's resistance front in operations in Syria and uh, Lebanon. And Washington has also shown its disrespect for other nations' sovereignty by conducting a deadly drone strike on the headquarters of Iraq's popular mobilization units in Baghdad. We'll try to bring to the spotlight the ramifications of Washington and uh, Tel Aviv's acts of terrorism in tonight's show. We have. Don DeBar, activist and commentator, joining us from Austin, in New York. And uh, academic and commentator Daniel Shaw, joining us from New York. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Uh, let's start off with Mr. DeBar uh, in Austin. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to kick off uh, this uh, segment uh, with the recent terror attack uh, in Kerman. In your opinion, uh, who benefits from such deplorable acts and uh, from attempts of creating this type of insecurity in the region? I mean, the thing was done on speculation, okay? There's an expectation that this act will create that effect. <clears throat> the uh, question is, of course, who did it and what did they intend? Uh, pretty clear it was the U.S. or Israel, the intent to create instability uh, in Iran, uh, to uh, provide some sort of domestic uh, satisfaction for people in Israel who are looking at Iran through the propaganda, you know, machinery there as an enemy or the enemy. Um, and so, you know, you can tell who benefits, basically, if they benefit, uh, by what happens. Well, you know, several things could happen. Iran shows, in fact, that it's a stable country, which it is, um, and it, you know, hunkers down and deals with the effects of this and makes a counter move that, you know, is satisfactory to the people in Iran and also a satisfactory lesson, perhaps, of the cost of doing these things to Israel and or the United States. The other is that they're successful and somehow it creates instability in Iran. I doubt that's going to happen, though, because um, <laughs> Israel is on a much weaker foundation than Iran. The, the people of Iran are, are sitting on land that they've been on, you know, going back to per the Persian Empire. Um, and the people of uh, Israel are sitting on land that they've been in since the late 19th century uh, from Europe um, and, and surrounded by enemies that they've created by inserting themselves into the middle of this region. So I, I don't think the intended effect is going to, uh, you know, express. And, uh, and I think it's pretty clear who did it and why. Daniel Shaw, regardless of who was behind uh, this attack, many analysts that we've spoken to here on Press TV see the Israelis as having a role uh, in uh, the terror attacks. And it's not unprecedented, of course, uh, for the uh, Israeli regime. What do you think? I agree with Mr. Debar. Uh, the same way that U.S. imperialism has used Israel since 1948 as a proxy force to do its dirty work in the area against the Lebanese, against the Syrians, against the Iranians, against the Palestinians, first and foremost, as they carry out a genocide, uh, likewise, they have used ISIS, uh, Jake Sullivan's uh, infamous quote from 2015 when he said that uh, ISIS were not their, uh, the State Department's enemies in Syria. How many times have they, uh, and this is what WikiLeaks and all of those cables, and that's why Julian Assange and others are in exile or uh, in, in, in jail because they were able to shed light on this topic, because what the U.S. wants to try to do with their war propaganda is wipe their hands clean of what happened about uh, some 60 hours ago in Tehran. Uh, there's nothing that can convince us that it wasn't uh, the Mossad and the Central Intelligence Agency, which has an undisclosed budget. Uh, it's an unvouchered budget, meaning they don't have to leave any uh, paper trail for all of their dirty work around the years. A budget somewhere in the range of $50 billion uh, per year for the CIA. And this is right up their alley. They strike one day in Beirut, they strike the next day in Tehran, and then they strike in Baghdad. The arrogance of this empire 
and of, of Zionism is almost unparalleled in history. Don DeBar, looking at the recent Israeli attacks in the region, the assassination of uh, the Iranian military advisor, uh, Sayyid Razi Mousavi in Syria, Hamas senior uh, official Saleh al-Aruri in Lebanon. Uh, are these Israeli attempts at expanding their onslaught on Gaza into a wider regional conflict and maybe trying to get uh, the, the United States more directly involved? The individual actors have, you know, their individual motivations. Netanyahu, first of all, has his own personal motivations, which is basically a sim single one, stay out of prison. He has to stay in office in order to stay out of prison. Um, he is uh, sitting on top of a coalition where he's really not the, the leading partner. <clears throat> and he's become a liability even to them uh, over his handling of this entire affair. Uh, and then there is the interest of the state of Israel, quote unquote, whatever elite that actually is in terms of making and expressing policy. Um, there's certainly the geopolitical interest of the United States, which Israel is a proxy for. It's, uh, they refer to it as a, an aircraft carrier and, and whatever, a battleship. Um, and behind that, even, you know, the, the oil companies basically that have a large chunk of the stock of the U.S. government. So, um, <clears throat> We're looking at a war over the resources there and and over not just the oil and gas and those resources and not even just the human resources, but also the you know the geographic resources that you know the the location itself is uh, an important strategic asset in in fighting Russia and China, which is also you know part of maybe perhaps their ultimate goal. So looking at how these things are playing out here, um, clearly, you look to what the interests of the U.S. and and of Israel as its you know local partner are, um, and how these things fit into it. I think that again, you consider the fact that there's a war going on, not, not the war that began quote unquote on October 7th, and not even the war that began uh, in with the Nakba in 1948. This is the war that's been going on since imperialism came to that part of the world to try to and for, for a long period of time to have seized. Uh, the resources or control of the resources there. Um, you're looking at uh, the, the uh, British changing the form of imperialism in 1948. Um, in the face, though, of Mossadegh coming to uh, power and, and the Iranian people really taking control of their fate up until the CIA coup in 1953, and then Nasser um, and uh, first the construction of uh, uh, the, the Egypt and um, uh, Syria and uh, and Iraq, which was coming on, you were going to see a United Arab Republic across the Arab world. Again, another anti-imperialist rise. The war that took all of those things down um, and then has, has saw a reversal with the Iranian Revolution in 1979 is ongoing. And this is just another battlefield in that entire, you know, in that larger war. Right. Uh, Mr. Shah, regarding the assassinations, Hezbollah leader uh, Said Hassan Nasrullah earlier today said that the blood of the martyrs of the resistance will not go in, uh, will not go in vain. And he also said that the killing of Saleh al-Aruri will not go unpunished. There were similar comments from Iran regarding the assassination of uh, Razi Mousavi in Syria. Are these actions producing the results that Israel and the U.S. were seeking? Or are they, in the words of Hassan Nasrullah, further igniting the resistance reg uh, front in the region? First off, uh, it's very clear that Israel is a Western imperialist creation. It's a Frankenstein. But is this Frankenstein slipping out of the control of their very handlers, of the Dr. Frankenstein that called them into existence? It seems that the U.S. does not want the upper summits of the U.S. ruling class. Do they really want a war with Iran? Uh, a nation of almost 100 million people, a rich civilization that goes back um, millennia. They can't handle the economic rise of China. Uh, Russia is whipping their behinds uh, in, in this NATO-U.S. proxy war against Russia with the Ukrainian people trapped in the middle. Do they really want to open up another massive front uh, against the Iranians, against the access of resistance? But there can be no doubt that there's an Israeli and a U.S. hand uh, behind these terrorist bombings in Tehran. Um, they bomb into Iraq. They bomb into Syria. They bomb the Syrian airports in, in, in Aleppo and in Damascus. 
They bomb the militias, the anti-imperialist militias in Iraq. They, they, they bomb at will. So the Israelis and the U.S. are, in a very cavalier way, they're inviting the resistance to strike back. Uh, of course, it's the military-industrial complex that runs the media in this country. And what we saw yesterday at about 2 p.m. was the most synchronized uh, statement from the New York Times and the BBC and the Israeli Times and Haaretz uh, wiping, uh, washing their hands clean as if the West had nothing to do with these terrorist bombings. But there's an abundance of proof. We have to read the gray zone, and we have to read uh, Aaron Mate in, in, in the geopolitical uh, report and these other outlets who've been tracking ISIS and their handlers from Benghazi and Libya to the ports of Turkey, uh, uh, back, back through Syria. Uh, WikiLeaks revealed this uh, Israeli U.S. ISIS nexus. Now, yesterday when they made that statement, of course, uh, liberals across the U.S. and everyday U.S. people thought, ah, this is surely a Shiite, uh, Sunni dynamic. But it's important to ask at the moment of, of, of the ultimate Muslim unity, of pan-Arab and Muslim unity in defense of the people of Palestine who are up against the genocide, right. who benefits from this terrorist bombing? Don DeBar, uh the resistance front in Iraq, it continues to put pressure on the U.S. administration with its anti-Israeli and anti-U.S. operations. But uh, Hassan Nasrallah for, uh, today earlier said that following the recent targeting of a leader of the popular mobilization uh, units in Baghdad, Iraqi politicians now have a historic opportunity to expel all U.S. forces from Iraq. Now let's go uh, rewind uh, to the uh, uh, assassination of General uh, Qasem Soleimani in 2020. Iran also said that one way of avenging his death would be the complete withdrawal of U.S. troops from the region. How close are we to seeing that day? I forget what the official count is, 2,500, I think, or supposedly. You know, recent events have actually, uh, you know, exposed the fact that the U.S. still occupies Iraq. You know, occupation is a fact, not necessarily, um, you know, a set of uh, individual uh, situations. For example, if the United States is exercising control at gunpoint of the, uh, na you know, the nation state or, or the policy making of, of Iraq, uh, whether they have a, a million troops there or two, um, the occupation is an occupation. Um, the fact that it's still occupied has been, ex again, exposed by the recent events there and the attacks on, on the uh, U.S. Uh, military assets by the Iraqi uh, forces and by the Iraqi people. Um, it, one of the things that gets sort of obfuscated in, in conversation about these matters is the word terrorism. I mean, we're talking about warfare, okay? Terrorism uh, is a term that came into usage when it, there were articles or acts of warfare committed by either non-state actors uh, or by the other, in terms of propaganda. In fact, uh, and 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 it's even more complicated, uh, given the uh, so, sort of the political, the uh, legal political uh, situation that exists on the ground in that region and in a number of other post-colonial regions. Um, you have contradictions between the you know the states themselves that are former colonial states and some semi-colonial states now. Um, and you have contradictions in some cases, like in Saudi Arabia, between the population that's there and, and the, you know, the government, uh, particularly in terms of relations with the United States and Israel. Um, and so uh, if you look at, get, lose all these, you know, other terms that are the popular ones and th think of it in, you know, strategic terms in terms of warfare, you have, you know, the, the populations in, you know, the population of the nations around um, Israel, the, pa around Palestine, uh, that are all in favor of protecting the Palestinian people and adamant about this, um, and now look witnessing like you know the worst genocide, you know certainly since there have been TV cameras to record it in, in human history, um, and and their governments debating at the United Nations about it, and finally one uh, nation uh, submitting a claim at the uh, ICJ. Um, there are a lot of 
those contradictions that are going to be resolved over the course of this, you know, whatever conflict. Um, and I, I think in some of some of the more reactionary states, you're going to see the governments change, including I don't mean just the individuals in the government, but the nature of the governments in relation to the people change. And that is going to happen under conditions of of active warfare, you know, in a number of these states and the state the, and it, what they call the state of Israel. And so it's difficult to predict what's going to happen. Uh, other than if some way isn't found to put this fire out and to provide justice and safety uh, for the Palestinian people, it's going to be a bloodbath there. Daniel Shaw, the Yemeni armed forces continue targeting uh, Israeli-linked ships and vessels bound for the occupied territories despite the formation of the U.S.-led naval coalition in the Red Sea and Washington's threats and warnings. Tell us more about this defiant message that the Yemenis are sending to the U.S. and its allies as uh, they've been clear these attacks will persist until Israel ends its crimes against Gazans. All of humanity has a debt with the Yemeni people with uh, who we call in the West the, the Houthis, these forces of resistance. I mean, this is a small country of only 30 million people and to stand up to empire and their Zionist underlings is extremely impressive. And this is on the heels of over seven years of a horrific uh, U.S. proxy war of using the Saudis uh, to really um, wage a campaign of, of, of starvation, of horrific bombing. Uh, against the Yemeni uh, people. This was um, horrific violence that we almost never learned about uh, here in the United States. And now they're doing the same thing to the Palestinian people. The U.S. has almost single-handedly destroyed Iraq, destroyed Syria through a covert, dirty war. They've dismembered and destroyed uh, Libya. And a big part of the foreign policy establishment wants to Iraqi eyes or Libya eyes or Syria eyes, uh, Iran, one of the strongest uh, countries in, in the region, and the spearhead of this axis of resistance, which counts among its uh, cadre, the Yemenis, uh, the Iraqi militias, uh, Hezbollah. There's no question that Israel wants every excuse, every pretext to continue bombing the daylights out of their neighbors. But as Mr. Debar has indicated, there's a half a million, half a billion uh, Arab people in the Arab world uh, watching on, uh, eight billion members of humanity watching this horrific Holocaust of the Palestinian people. So, when would Israel ever have peace with its neighbors when, for 75 years, they've treated their neighbors with genocidal violence? Sure, Don Debar. In spite of all the efforts to weaken uh, the resistance uh, in in the region. Why is the resistance front still thriving? This is what human beings do. <laughs> um, we don't die easily, um, and, and any of us, uh, as, as a group, as uh, individuals. It's in our nature to try to live. Um, you know, the, the, it's, the way this thing is taking shape is an unusual, you know, historically unusual uh, uh, methodology um, being expressed. It, it's kind of like at an individual, you know, national or regional level uh, where you would have a guerrilla war um, as a you know, revolutionary uh, spear. Um, only this is the, you know, falling together of those aspects of the various nation states in, in the area uh, that see the emergency that, that, that has to be addressed and rolling up their sleeves and, and, and you know, get, going to do it. Um, any one of these individual states declares war on Israel, the United States, and Israel focus their, you know, whatever, the power they have, their militaries on that to make an example of them in front of the others. That's their traditional model. Looking to the Vietnamese uh, war, or the, the American war, as they call it in Vietnam, the resistance there was not conventional resistance. And this that we're seeing develop here is an unconventional resistance also, kind of that sort of model um, that, uh, you know, may well produce some unexpected results that they're not, they hadn't planned on in the Pentagon or in Langley uh, or wherever, the, whatever rat hole they uh, make these plans on in the so-called state of Israel. Dan, Michel, I find a question for you as well. Uh, why is the resistance front still thriving in the region in spite of all the efforts to weaken it? 
Ho Chi Minh said no amount of modern uh, war technology could de defeat a people's will to be independent. This is about uh, sovereignty. This is about indigenous dignity. Uh, the U.S. and Israel would have to wipe every last Iranian, every last Arab, every last Alawite, every last Kurd off of the face of the earth. Um, people are going to continue to resist. And how could we ever forget the chief of the Mossad as well, who said publicly that Al Nusra Front, that the worst terrorist outfits operating in the Syrian theater and the Iraqi theater were allies of the Israelis and deserved compassion. And, and he said this publicly on, on Al Jazeera. So we have an abundance of, of, of proof that the Israelis and the U.S. have indeed kept Al Qaeda and ISIS on a short leash. And this is something that the American public has to look into closely, uh, as, as well as the Western, the Western world. Mr. Dubar, I saw you nodding there. Would you like to share with us your final thoughts? Yeah, I agree completely. I think uh, citing Ho Chi Minh uh, as Dan just did is exactly appropriate. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, activist and commentator Don Dubar joining us from Austin, uh, New York, and uh, also uh, from New York academic and commentator Daniel Shaw. Gentlemen, thank you for contributing uh, to our program, and also a special thanks uh, to you, our viewers, for staying with us on tonight's uh, Spotlight. It's good night for now, and see you next time.